Which ones are those? Okay. Confusion, yeah, but. Okay, so we have the cells, isn't it? Okay, give me the cells of the innate immune system. That's simple, guys. So now I want the cells, the leukocytes that participate in the innate immune system. Yes. Neutrophils is very good, isn't it? They're the prominent cells in that cell. Yes, what else? Basophils, yes, kind of, yeah. Yeah? Mast cells, yes, very good. Uh -huh. huh? Macrophages, isn't it? And then we know that macrophages participate both in the innate as well as the adaptive, isn't it? Okay, so uh, we have like, what's the question I'm asking now? Okay, so how does the innate system protect us? What are the parts of the innate system that protect us, apart from the cells? Okay, so we have things like what? Under the innate, yes please, boss. Was that a hand or you were stretching? <laughs> yes, I can't hear you. The skin, isn't it? That falls under what, guys? Physical barriers. Very good. Okay. So physical barriers have got things like the skin, isn't it? What else? Mucus, man? Membrane, isn't it? What else do we have under physical barriers? Okay, so that's uh, under uh, mucus membrane. Because remember, the eye is prepared by mucus. Membrane, okay? So we've got the skin, we've got mucous membrane, isn't it? We even have fluids, isn't that so? Okay, things like tears, okay? Saliva, they contain uh, things or uh, bacterial cells, isn't it? Like defensives and lysosomes, isn't that so? Okay? Apart from physical barriers, what else is there in the innate immune system that's going to protect us? I've been you guys one thing, physical barriers, what else? You guys are not studying. It's showing. So the genitalia is under mucus membrane, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So the thing is, you've got the skin that is lining the outer, isn't it? Mucus membranes are lining us on the inside, mostly. Okay. So what else do we have? It's just physical barriers. That is, that is it. It ends there. Yes, please. Yeah? The what? The what? what? <laughs> Humora. Humora is under adapt? adaptive. Adaptive. So what we're going to do with the antibodies that is under humoral immune system. Remember, adaptive is for cell mediated as well as humor, isn't it? Cell mediated, I'm talking about the lymphocytes, okay? And then under humor, I'm talking about the B cells and their products which are under antibodies, isn't it? Okay. So, uh, uh, yes, please, sir, huh? Please speak up. To? Confirm. Confirm, yeah. So now remember, the inlet was the first, what the first line again? Under your book that you're using. The first line was what? The? So now under inlet, under first line, what was there? So remember what they said you guys, isn't it? As long as under inlet, it's still one thing, isn't it? 
whether it's physical barriers or the cells themselves, is still under inert. So when you're talking about looking it broadly, there are two types of systems that are functioning. Okay, first line is inert. Physical, you can't remove it, it's still under inert. So whether some groups just talk about the primary, secondary, and tertiary um, means types of system, but then broadly, the first and second are still part of inert. So we just group it together. Okay? Yes? Is there any other question, guys? This is not answering my question. Maybe you can ask your question, then I can help. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Complement is going to be a topic on its own. So that's the next topic we're going to learn. So here are the antibodies. The next is complement, then hypersensitivity reactions. Okay, for those who want to study ahead. The others are studying ahead, huh? They're not complements. Okay? Any questions, guys, on what we have done so far? <laughs> Okay, so let's go back to the adaptive visit. What types of antigens do we have? What are the types of antigens that we have? And how do we classify them? How do we classify antigens? The class, yes? Yes, that's a broad one, very good. So it can either be endogenous antigens or exo, is it? Exo from the outside. Endogenous within the cell, is it? And then we say that some of the exogenous can also become endogenous if they become cytoplasmic, isn't that so? Okay, very good. Apart from that broad classification, what other ways can we classify the antigens? Yes, please. Very good, okay. So under, under exogenous, <coughs> under endogenous we have which ones? Even the viral can also, remember the viral are the ones that can start as exo, then they become endogenous, isn't it? And then we also have the tumor cells, isn't it? That are also known as endogenous, okay? So now what about the other types of classifications? So that's the broad one, endogenous and exogenous. What about the other classifications that are there? Yes? Antigens, guys, that was the previous lecture we had, isn't that so? That's why I thought the data is going to be fresh. Bring it out, the that, that you have jumped. You guys like gunning, I right, for the test. Let me tell you, medicine, gunning won't help you at all, okay? Because the thing is that what you guys are learning now, you need to use it next year. So if you're gunning it, next year again you're going to have problems. Because gunning, the data is on the retina, isn't it? Once it leaves, it's gone left on the paper, it's not in your head. You get my point? So the best way of studying this thing, because the principles we're seeing you now, you would need them as a doctor. You get my point? You guys are going to be treating conditions and diseases. So how do you treat those conditions and diseases if you've got no idea about the basics? You get my point? Yeah, and you can't give the issue of, what's, what's, your, what's your excuse? What's the excuse you have? No, 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 that's not an excuse at all. Because you see, the goodness now is that you guys are living in an in, in, in electronic age, isn't it? If you missed a lecture, you can actually have lectures from YouTube, isn't that so? The same things I'm telling you guys, plenty of lectures I'm talking about them on YouTube. So that's not an excuse I'm going to, I'm going to accept, okay? So you can learn these things, if you're not understanding what you're reading, the YouTube videos that you can use. Okay, with actually even better lecturers, isn't it? Or the same things. So that's not an excuse you can use, guys. Okay? And then remember, our, our job is to facilitate your learning. Guide you, give you the pointers that you need to study on your own. Spoon feeding finished in grade 12. You get my point? Here we just give you the structure. Then you fill it up. You get my point? I'll give you also the structure of immunology is a Coca-Cola bottle. Now you find it better to put into that water, cock bottle. My point is to guide you so that you know what areas to study. It's not to feed you everything. You get my point. So you guys need to study. If you're going to be, if you have to be doctors, start. You can't run away from studying. I tell you, no matter how how much of a genius you are, you may have been the best at your school. It doesn't work like this here. You get my point. Those who put in the effort, those who study, 
and others are going to thrive. Your six point does not matter here. It helps you enter NS. It doesn't help you pass. You get my point? Yes. So use those brains of yours, which allowed you to come here, to actually study and understand these things. You get my point? A lot of people have failed with six points and five points, okay? Because they thought that their brains were just going to miraculously help them pass you. It doesn't work like that, okay? The more you study, the more you understand these concepts, the more you're going to be better. And then the problem is that most of these courses are interrelated. That's the problem. So if you mess up immunology, you're going to mess up the other things as well because they're connected. And once you find that connection, it helps you uh, understand things even much better. Okay? Vavoda? Makwani, sir? Oh, cool. Okay, so you guys, please, I beg, I beg, I beg, hey. The things we have done, the introductions and everything, please go through them. For those who haven't yet done that, please go through them because we're just reading on the things we've already taught. So if you don't study the things you've done before, you are challenging understanding what we're going to talk about now. Okay? So remember last time we talked about the fact that uh, under the antigens, we talked about the fact that T cells uh, accept antigens in a different way, isn't it? And then B cells also are able to interact with antigens in a different way. And we discussed how antigens are presented to the T cells by the antigen presenting cells, isn't it? Which ones are those? The antigen presenting cells, the main ones that we have. The antigen presenting cells, which ones are those? The? Dendritic, isn't it? Those are the professional antigen presenting cells that the, the biggest, isn't it? Okay? Then we have which other ones? Macrophages, isn't it? Okay? As well as B cells. Okay? B cells can also present antigens to the T cells. And we say that T cells cannot uh, recognize the antigen unless it's presented to them via which molecule? MHC, isn't it? Okay. So MHC, there are two types. MHC class 1 and 2, isn't it? So MHC class 1 presents antigens to which T cell? CD what? CD8, isn't it? And then CD4 is presented by the MHC class 2. Okay. Very good. Now remember, we say that B cells also are antigen presenting cells. Okay? And we talked about the B cell receptor last time. The basal receptor is made up of what, guys? Basal receptor. The basal receptor is made up of what? In a naive basal, what are we going to find on the receptor of the basal? In a naive basal, what's the receptor made up of? Ig what and Ig what? Yes, please. IgM and IgD, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So in a naive basal, which has not yet ever met an antigen, the B cell receptor is made up of IgM and IgD. The antibodies, the same ones, the IgM and IgD, they also act, apart from them acting as B cell receptor, they're also able to be soluble, isn't it? They can move away from the B cell and function on their own, okay? So today we're going to learn about the structure of the antibodies, how they function, with or without the B cell, okay? And then we're going to also understand the differences between the T cell receptor as well as the B cell. When a T cell is interacting with an antigen, isn't it? So you have the T cell receptor interact with the MHC class, isn't it? Whichever it is, whether it's MHC class one or class two. What other thing is supposed to interact for it to actually be stimulated and activated? <coughs> okay. So this T cell receptor interacting with the MHC class, isn't it? That's the first binding, isn't it? You have a secondary binding that needs to happen for the tissue to be activated. What interacts in that sense? B what? Because remember, the, the MHC class is presenting the antigen to the tissue, isn't it? But then the tissue has to be activated to produce cytokines. And it needs a secondary coupling for it to be activated. Which ones are the molecules that are involved in the secondary coupling of the T cell receptor for it to be activated to produce cytokines? Yes, please. Very 
God. Okay. So pass that the man guys come. Your band, your band. These are the things I'm going to be asking. So if now you are you are rolling your eyes and scratching your head. Okay, the tests are coming, eh? Okay, so antibodies, guys. Okay, so we already know antibodies are formed by B cells, isn't it? They are on, not only formed by B cells, but they're also part of the B cell. In B cells that have already uh, been acquainted to antigens, what are we going to find on the B cell receptor? Which, which IG, IGs are we going to find there? On the, on the activated B cells. IG? IgA, IgG, and? IgA, isn't it? Okay, very good. Okay. So that's what I'm going to talk about today now in detail. Okay. So what cells actually form the antibodies? B cells are activated and then they differentiate into what kind of cells for them to form antibodies? Plasma? Very good. Plasma cells. Okay. So IgG, I mean Ig just stands for immunoglobulin, isn't it? So antibodies are found in the class of proteins known as immunoglobulins. So whichever antibody you're talking about, IgM, the Ig at the beginning is immunoglobulin. Okay, so immunoglobulin alpha, immunoglobulin delta, immunoglobulin epsilon, and so on and so forth. Okay, depending on what the letter is at the end. So the Ig at the beginning is immunoglobulin. That's the class of proteins which the antibodies are found in. That's the first thing we're supposed to know, okay? And then they make up about 20% of all plasma proteins, okay? Which one is the most abundant protein in the plasma? That gives the plasma its oncotic pressure or osmotic uh, value. Hmm? Albumin, isn't it? So albumin is the major protein in the plasma. Secondary to albumin, you have the immunoglobulin. So the secondary protein in the, pla in the plasma that give the blood or the uh, liquid part of blood, that colloid, colloid pressure, okay? Okay, or the osmotic pressure that you find in the blood, the majority of it is from the proteins. Most the albumin, but secondary to albumin, we have immunoglobulins. Are we clear, guys? Okay, so now remember we said that an antigenic determinant is an area on a pathogen with which uh, either the tissue receptor of the MHC class, isn't it, or even the antibody is going to bind to. Isn't that so? Okay, remember we talked about the fact that pathogens are put antigenic areas, isn't it? Okay, those are also known as what? Epitopes, isn't that so? So those are areas where the, uh, either the uh, anti, uh, T cell receptor or the B cell receptor can actually bind them. Okay. So those are known as antigenic determinants. And those antigenic determinants, they give three categories on how antibodies can react. Okay. So these three are isotypic, allotypic, and idiotypic. Okay. So for instance, in a normal body, okay, when an antibody binds to normal cells, for instance, we say that if you have a hypersensitivity reaction, isn't it? The body creates antibodies of IgE, isn't that so? Which are going to bind to the basal fields, isn't it? That interaction between the IgG of your own body binding to the basal fields, that is an isotypic interaction. Because they are both tissue from the same person, isn't it? It's both from me, isn't it? We talked about osmolarity. We know, you know, hyper or smaller, hyper or smaller, and iso or smaller. You guys learn this, isn't it? Okay. If something is hyper or small, uh, a hyper is called a hyper osmolarity. It means it's very concentrated, isn't that so? If it's hyper, it means it's what? Huh? Less concentration, isn't it? If it's iso, it means what? Same. So there'll be no neck movement, isn't that so? So the same thing. So if it's same. It means that if an antibody binds to something that is found within its same body, that's an iso interaction, isn't that so? Okay. So isotypic interactions of antibodies are found in normal individuals. You get. Okay. So that is that. Allotypic. Okay. So say I've lost blood. Isn't that so? I need blood. Okay. 
and I called the hospital to get the blood donation. Am I going to donate to myself or someone else is going to give me the blood? Somebody else, isn't it? Do we share the same genetics? No, we do not, okay? So if they give me their blood, and my antibodies interact with the blood from that person, that is known as an allotypic interaction. Because even though we're from the same species, we are different individuals, isn't it? Okay, so when you get blood from somebody else, okay, or you get tissue, or whichever it is, that interaction between your antibodies and the tissue or the blood from another person, that is going to be known as an allotypic interaction. Are we clear on that part, guys? Okay. And then also have what is known as idiotypic interaction. If I and then I lose blood, and then my twin gives me his blood, our genetics is identical, isn't it? If my antibodies bind to the blood that I receive from my twin, that interaction is not going to cause anything, isn't it? There'll be no harm because our genes are, are essentially the same. So that is known as an idiotypic interaction, okay? So if I get maybe tissue or blood from an identical twin, because we share the same genetics, that interaction is known as an idiotypic interaction, okay? What is not common is me getting blood, say, from a pig, isn't it? Or getting blood from a cow. We know automatically my body is going to react because we are different species, isn't that so? Okay, that is known as a xenotypic interaction, but it's not common because we don't really do that, isn't it? Okay, so the most common ones are either isotypic, okay, allotypic, or idiotypic because this actually happened in real life. Okay. And then, okay, so we, we know what pathogenic determinant is, guys. You say it's any part on a pathogen which can be bound by a receptor, isn't it? Whether it's a receptor or any receptor on there, leukocytes. That's an antigenic determinant, okay? So now we say that a, a, a bacteria or a virus may not have one, isn't it? One area where it is bound, it may have several things. Because remember, these antigenic determinants can be proteins, can be the capsule of the bacteria, isn't it? It can be the flagella on the bacteria, it can be different things. So all those things, so one pathogen can have several parts or points where antibodies can bind or where the leukocyte receptors can actually bind. Okay. And then now, the number of antigens, okay, that can be bound by an antibody determine its valency, okay? So the, the smallest antibody has got two areas where it can bind to antibodies, meaning that it's bivalent, you get. So say it's got four areas where it can bind to antibodies, then it's going to be called what? Tetra, and so on and so forth, okay? So depending on the type of antibody that you have, and the number of antigen bindings that it can allow, that determines the valency of the antibody. The minimum valency you're going to have for an antibody is bivalent, okay? And then, of course, the maximum we have is the decavalent. Decavalent means how many, guys? Ten, isn't it? Okay, we find that on the IgM, okay? Because it's got ten sites which can be bound by antigens, okay? So now, looking at that, if you have a bivalent antibody binding to antigen, isn't it? Versus a decavalent antibody <coughs> binding to antigens, which one is going to elicit the most immune response in the body? Is it the bivalent or decavalent? Deca, isn't it? Why? Because it's bigger, isn't that so? Remember, the size of the reaction is very important, isn't it? And we say that attaching proteins to antigens increases their antigenic Antigenesis, isn't it? Okay, so a bigger cluster of antibodies around an antigen is going to cause a higher immune response. Okay, are we on together to that point, guys? Very good. So the structure, okay, of the antibodies. So the antibodies have got, is that a question you have? Yes. So speak out if you want to ask. <coughs> I can't get what you're saying.
So an antibody is going to have a region where it can bind antigens. Okay. And so that region where it binds antigen, the number of regions which an antibody has that can bind antigens is known as the valency of the antibody. Okay? So the smallest antibody that we know is IG what? IgG, isn't it? Okay? It's got two binding sites for antigens. Okay? Meaning that it's a bivalent antibody. Okay? While, if we're talking about the IgM, it's the biggest antibody, it's got 10 binding sites, okay, for uh, antigens, so it's decavalent. So the valence is just about how many parts on the antibody can actually bind to the antigen. Are you clear on that? Very good. Are there any other questions, guys? Are we, can we move on? Okay, cool. So the antibodies, guys, are made up of two things. We've got a heavy chain and a light chain, okay? They've got a heavy chain and a light chain, okay? Heavy chain and light chain are bound together by the uh, disulfide bonds, okay? As well as the heavy chains also are bound to each other by the sulfide bonds, okay? So the interaction between the heavy chains and the light chains, and then also an interaction between the heavy chains themselves. You get my point, hey? We're going to see it clearly when we see the, the particles. So we've got two light chains and two heavy chains. So by the name heavy chain, you know it's a bigger chain, isn't it? It's bigger because it's got more amino acids, it's uh, heavier, okay? So uh, that's on the two things that make up the antibody, heavy chain, light chain, okay? And then, I've already talked about the binding, isn't it? So there's binding between the two heavy chains, the sulfide bonds, isn't it? And binding between the light chain and the heavy chain. Both bindings are via the sulfide bonds, okay? And then, both the heavy chain and the light chain have got two regions. They've got a variable region and a constant region, okay? So the variable region is different, okay? It varies depending on what antigen an antibody has been has bound to. It's what determines which antibodies an antibody is going to bind to, okay? And then the constant region, this one is most important because it determines what type of antibody you're dealing with, okay? I'll go, I'll, I'll explain in detail later. So for now, just know that there's constant region and the variable uh, region, okay? For both the light chains and the heavy chains. So if you see VL means variable region, um, and variable uh, region found on the light chain, okay? CH, uh, I mean CH, constant region on the heavy. You get my point, eh? Okay, for those who don't understand what the, uh, these are, okay? So, the complementary <coughs> determining regions are those regions where the antibody is actually binds, isn't it? Okay, where the uh, antibody binds to the antigen, okay? So that whole part where the anti antibody binds to the antigen is known as the FAB region, okay? Or the antigen binding region of the antibody, okay? And then we have the FC region, okay? This is known as the crystalline, C stands for crystalline, okay? That is a region where the antibody, uh, different types of antibodies, it determines the different types of antibodies, okay? It gives a structure for different types of antibodies. So for instance, what we differentiate between IgG and IgE is the FC region, you get. Okay, what differentiate between IgM and IgA? It's the FC region. They're different and they determine what type of antibody you're actually uh, dealing with. Okay. So we have, an, you've seen how the light chain, isn't it? So that's the a, that's a light chain, okay, and the heavy chain. You've seen the heavy chain is longer, isn't it? It's what makes it heavier because it's made up of more amino acids. The light chain is short. Okay, but as you can see, there's a, there's a connection between the light chain and the heavy chain, isn't it? And also a connection between the two heavy chains, okay, by the, the sulfide bonds, okay? So the FAB region, as I said, FAB region is a variable region, isn't it? Okay, and it presents the cleft that is formed between the uh, variable region of the heavy chain and the variable region of the uh, light chain, okay? And this is where the interaction between the antibody and the antigen is going to take place, okay? And then also, depending on what type of junction is there between the variable regions and the constant regions, 
it will determine how flexible the antibody is, okay? So some of the antibodies are what are known as hinges, okay? They're connected, the variable region and the coastal region are connected by a hinge. Those antibodies are able to swivel, okay? And that makes them more flexible, isn't it? Okay? Then the other antibodies that don't, that don't have a hinge joint between the variable and the constant regions. Those ones don't have as much flexibility compared to the ones that have the hinge. Okay. Yeah? Someone ask me a question? Yes? Come back, boss. On the what? The haptens, yes. <coughs> Which receptor are they talking about? <coughs> so the haptens, isn't it? Okay, so remember, one of the functions we're going to learn about the antibodies, I think I'll explain it later. Okay, just, just hold on. So you don't go ahead of the lecture. Okay. So FC region, guys, I was telling you that the FC region is a crystalline region, isn't it? And it's what is different for the different subtypes of the antibodies. Variability really is about the antibody adapting to bind to antigens, isn't it? So the, even, even under the IgG, they're going to have different variable regions because each antibody can bind a different antigen. You get my point? So that's what the variability is supposed to be. For the FC region, it's going to be constant because it's what gives the structure, whether it's IgG or IgE or IgN, so on and so forth. Okay. So this is the fab. You guys have seen the fab region, isn't it? So the fab region, as you can see, we've got two of them, isn't it? That's for uh, that's the simplest structure for the antibody. Okay. We've got two of them, as you can see. That's why the anti antigen is going to bind. So that blue thing that is there is representing the antigen, isn't it? Okay, and then if you've noticed between the variable regions, so the variable region is the one that is on top on the, okay, on this, can you guys see the, the Kesa? You can see the Kesa? No. You can't see the Kesa? No. Okay, so if you guys see, there's more of a gap, isn't it? On the heavy chains, okay? So everything above that is considered as the variable region, and everything below that is considered as the as the constant, isn't it? Okay, so for those antibodies that have got more like a gap, there's more like a spring connecting the variable and the constant regions. Those are what we know that are hinged antibodies, you get my point, eh? The ones that are more flexible, okay? Other ones, there's no gap, meaning that there's no gap between the constant and the variable, so those things kind of like close up and they're more like connected, isn't it? The smaller space, so that's why there's no uh, hinge, okay? So those are exactly the things we're talking about. The antigen binding site, okay, the FC region, the FAB region. You guys have seen the heavy chain variable region, isn't it? And the light and variable region, as well as the constant region for both, isn't it? Okay, so this is uh, about the structure of the antibody. You're supposed to know this, okay? Because you need to know which part of the antibody do what. Okay, and which parts are going to undergo mutation, for instance, once an antibody is activated or binds to an, an antigen. Okay. Okay, I think we've talked about this already, guys. Heavy chain and so on and so forth, isn't it? Okay, let's move on. So now, the different types, you guys are going to have these notes. So you can go, it's just talking about the constant regions, how many can there be? Maximum is about four, okay? So for instance, those that are for the hinge, we only have three. Those that are the hinge are going to have the maximum of four. You get my point? The constant regions, okay? And then how many variable regions are there? That's all that is there on the previous slide. You can just read that on your own. It's not very, very important, okay? What I want you to understand is now the different types of antibodies. Have you guys seen how the, the difference between the IgG and IgE? Which one is hinged, IgG or IgE? IgG is hinged, isn't it? Which other one is hinged? IgD and IgA, okay? So the hinged ones are IgE and IgM. They don't have a hinge, meaning that 
their flexibility is limited, isn't it, compared to the others? Because these others can actually manipulate themselves, distort their shape to actually be able to bind uh, antigens better. The other ones don't have the ability to swivel. You get my point? Okay. So now you've actually seen how the structure of the, um, of the antibodies are. Now we can now go into the details of the different types. Okay? I think I've talked about the variable region already, isn't it? What is possible for and so on. Isn't that so? Are we clear on the variable on the constant region of the antibodies? Are we clear? You're not clear? Okay. So the variable region, we said is responsible for antigen binding, isn't it? That's one thing, okay? And then, uh, the binding between the antibody, okay, and the antigen is through this force, isn't it? The one that was force, isn't it? Okay, one divorce forces are the ones that cause the binding of the, we learned this in chemistry, isn't it? Hydrogen bonding. And so on. Guys, then then. That's Mr. Chanibun. Okay, so these are the binding, isn't it? If you guys look at these bonds, do they look like they're strong bonds or not? They're weak, isn't it? They're weak, it's weak binding, okay? Why? Because one, you don't want it to be a very strong bond, isn't it? So that it's easy for the antigen to be moved inside the cell, okay, to move from the uh, B cell receptor into the cell, and also to be presented to the, to the T cell. You get my point, okay? So there's a very strong binding, okay? Affinity maturation is something that we're supposed to really understand, guys. We talked about this already. Remember, we said that when you have an antigen coming to the body for the first time, isn't it? That first interaction is going to be weak. Okay, because the body is getting to know the antigen for the first time. Okay, that is one of the primary response, isn't it? However, from the primary response, we're going to get memory cells. Okay, these memory cells know the antigen better. Okay, meaning that the next time you're going to have an interaction between the antigen and the antibodies or the adaptive immune system, there's going to be a stronger immune response, isn't it? Okay, so now the difference is that. For antibodies, the mechanism in which they get to know the antigen better and pre uh, prepare for a more um, prompt and bigger response on the secondary interaction is through two mechanisms, okay? This is why antibodies have got better affinity for antigens compared to the T cells. Because there are two mechanisms that they use for uh, determining their affinity to antigens through their memory uh, B cells, okay? So, the affinity from the first time to the second time, it increases almost several fold, isn't it? Okay? You know that if we, if we, we increase by a log fold, that is higher, isn't it? You can remember the logs and the, what you call it, it's a log and what? In maths. Huh? What have we not been done? Okay, so if I increase something by say two, isn't it? And I increase something by a log of a two, which one is bigger? Okay, guys, let's not go to my sign. So there's a big increase, right? <laughs> there's a big increase, okay? There's a big increase in the affinity of the antibody to go the environment. Okay, we have the genes, of course, themselves, whether they're dominant or recessive, isn't it? And also, like a dominant or hetero, like a dominant, isn't it? Okay, all those are factors. Okay, so it's the same thing when it comes to the immune system. Okay, if as a mother I've encountered a lot of antigens, isn't it? My body has mutated my, my body in terms of the white blood cells, have been to find a way to tackle those antigens. When my daughter inherits my genes, there's going to be more mutations on those genes she received from me for the white blood cells, meaning that she will learn to fight and... Uh, you get my point? Okay? So, 
within ourselves, whether it's depending on the diet and so on, there are other factors that can determine whether your immune system is strong or not, isn't it? The others who you can all be exposed to the same flu. Sometimes not the flu going around in campus, isn't it? But not everyone is going to be affected the same, isn't it? Others will be knocked out, isn't that so? But others will just have, maybe just sneeze a little bit, but they still can move on. Others won't be affected at all. That is what contributes to the polymorphisms that we see. You get my point, eh? So, some genes can be different in the environment, okay? Those are what are known as polymorphisms, where a gene has got different representations in the environment. So, this uh, somatic habitation, remember the somatic meaning that they're happening to me, isn't it? They're not, they're not, it's not based on what my parents had, isn't that so? Okay? This can determine how my immune system is going to be. Okay? So Number two is clonal selection, okay? When an antibody interacts with an antigen, okay, they know each other, isn't it? Among us, the memory B cells that have survived from the first interaction, the body will still have to sieve, okay? Which one have got a stronger affinity to their antigen? Those who speak affinity to the antigen are going to be deleted. So it only means those that have got a high affinity to their antigen, okay? In with every subsequent interaction that you have with the same antigen, your body keeps on sieving, you get my point, to leave only memory cells that have got higher affinity every time. Meaning that if you have an interaction with antigen five times, by the fifth time, those memory cells should have a higher affinity compared to the first time, isn't it? And so on and so forth, okay? So that is known as the clonal selection, okay? So the somatic habilitation and clonal selection is what gives B cell receptors high affinity to antibodies compared to the T cell receptors. Because T cell receptors only have clonal selection. They do not have somatic hypermutation. Are we clear on that, guys? Yes? Okay, so that's different. Remember, hypersensitivity is a different topic. We won't talk about it. That's your body overreacting. Yeah. So your body doesn't yeah. the genes. It's the same thing with hypersensitivity. The body memorize, okay, uh, the antigens. So the first every time you have that interaction, it's like your body is having that interaction for the first for the first time. So that's why it's different for the hypersensitivity. Who asked the question? Are you clear? Are you clear? Okay, good. Okay. So this is what I was talking about, guys. Have you seen how you have like an antigen comes and interacts, isn't it? So first you have the first mutation, the there's reduced antigen binding, isn't it? Or going to kill off those cells, okay? The other cell has got enhanced uh, antigen binding, it's allowed to survive, isn't it? Okay, and then also then there go more mutations, okay? The mutations either help or do not help. So those that are going to cause the, uh, the cell to have an increased affinity for the antigen, those are the cells that are going to be preserved. You get my point? So as my body is fighting bacteria of this, it's going to be mutating, isn't it? To be able to fight those infections better having a higher affinity for the antigen are going to allow those cells to survive, isn't it? Those that don't allow the cells to be deleted, okay? This is known as what, guys? Huh? Huh? Get you. <laughs> hmm? Somatic? Are you sure? <laughs> if it's not selected, it's because it's just for the mutation, isn't it? That is a different thing altogether. <laughs> this is clonal selection, guys. Okay. So I think this picture we talked about already, isn't it? Okay, in the previous lectures. Okay. So now let's go to the classes themselves. That picture is just. Primary response is going to be small, primary response is going to be big. Okay, that is all. There's nothing special about that slide. So we move on. Okay. So the first class is the IG. IgG. Okay. 
This you need to know. You need to know the differences between the classes, how they function, where they found, and so on and so forth. Okay. IgG, first one. Okay. So it is the most abundant immunoglobulin, isn't it? Yes. Okay. It makes up 80% of all the antibodies that are found in the blood. Okay. That is the IgG. It's found in blood, lymph, and also in the GIT. Okay. We know what GIT stands for, isn't it? Good. Okay. So if you get if you get a value normally, you, if you get the value okay of the IgG in the blood, you're gonna get about about 10 milligrams per meal of IgG in normal individuals, isn't it? And then if you uh, have a secondary infection, what will happen to the level is going to go up, isn't it? Okay. So if it goes higher, okay. 10 milligrams per meal, then you know there's secondary what? Infection in the body, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. It is divalent or bivalent. Meaning that what, guys? It can bind how many antigens at a time? Two. Two. Very good. Okay. It's also the most abundant in newborns. Okay. It's also the most abundant in what? What is it abundant in newborns, guys? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's very good. Yes, that's the reason. Very good. Okay. Because remember, the mother protects the baby even in utero, isn't it? From all infections and so on. Okay. So she'll share her IgG with the baby. Okay. So if you're a mother also who's encountered more antigens and more bacteria, your baby is more protected against the infections, isn't it? Okay. So if you're also very clean, you don't like to interact with dead and so on, okay, the chances, the chances, okay, of something happening to baby are what? A high, okay? So don't be too clean, ladies. Too clean. <laughs> Sanitizing everything. Even the wrong things, eh? Okay? Some things are not meant to be sunny. I'll uh, end there, guys. Okay? <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Okay, so there are four classes of IgG. Okay, so there's IgG1 to IgG4, okay? Remember we talked about the fact that within a class there can be a subclass, isn't it? Okay, so under IgG you've got four subclasses. Okay, and these are important because different classes have got different functions and different strengths. Okay, I'm gonna learn in this, uh, down here, okay? So for instance, this one we said is gonna be prominent in secondary immune response, isn't it? So it's formed by what kind of B cells, guys? What kind of beast are going to produce the IgG? Memory? Memory beast out, guys. Isn't it? Isn't that what we said? Hey! So why is that? It's a complement acting with antibodies, okay? It's it, it, uh, a special complement. Complement is very important under the innate, isn't it? Okay, so remember we talked about the fact that the innate and adapt sometimes work to work yeah. together to fight infection. Okay, so it activates a complement. Okay, it can cause the placenta. And these subtypes, the one, three, and four, are the ones that are able to actually cross, meaning that IG2 cannot cross the placenta. Okay, and then IG1 and the IG3, these ones have got a high affinity for the F FCR. Okay, remember talking about those cells that uh, interact with antibodies as a mechanism of fighting diseases like which cells? Mass cells, isn't it? Yes. Which other cells? Vessel fields, isn't it? Yes. And which other cells? It's no fields, isn't it? These ones can have antibodies on their cell membrane, isn't it? Ready to capture antigens, okay? For them to be able to interact with the antibodies in that way, they need to have this FCR or FC receptor. Okay, FC, the R is for receptor, okay? So if they have the FC receptor, then they can have antibodies on their cell membrane, okay? And then they can fight infection both using their inherent mechanism as well as using their antibodies. Okay, guys? Okay. 
So that's IgG. I think we are done with IgG. Are we okay on the IgG? What it is? Yes, please. <laughs> There? So it could be that it's, it's could, it could be due to its polarity because remember the placenta is also a cell membrane, isn't it? A membrane, a membrane which is protecting it. So what helps the IgG past the placenta is one, it's lipophilic, isn't it? And two, it's small and non-polar. Okay? So these principles are very important for anything to cross a membrane. Okay? So if something has got a high polarity, probably maybe its functional group is something that prevents it from passing through the placenta, okay? Possibly, okay? Then we have the IgM, okay? This one is said in terms of size, the biggest, isn't it? Okay, and it's found where? Which part of, which response? Huh? Primary, isn't it? Primary mean response. It is, what's the balance of the IgM? 10, isn't it? It can bind 10 and 10 at the same time, okay? Which is very good, okay? Compared to the IgG, not so much, isn't it? IgG was 10 milligrams per meal. This one is what? 1.5, isn't it? So it's not very much compared to the IgM, I mean to the IgG. It's pentameric, meaning that it is decavalent, okay? Uh, it's found in the blood, lymph, and on B cells. Why is it not found? IgG was found in the blood, leaf, and GIT, isn't it? Okay. What do you think is found in the GIT if it's not IgM? I talked about the thing, one of the lectures we had. Which antibody is found mostly in secretions? IgM, isn't it? Yeah, so those are things that you're supposed to remember, guys. Okay, and apply them in the future lectures. Okay, so primary response, okay. And then it is present on most of the uncommitted B cells. Uncommitted are which ones? The naive ones, isn't it? The ones that have not yet interacted with the antigen. Once they interact with the antigen, what happens? There's going to be a change, isn't it? From IgM to IgG, or Ig what? Or the others, isn't it? Depending on the type of antigen that they're interacting with. Okay. Okay, so this one, is more efficient in agglutination, okay? So this is where antibodies bind around uh, an antigen and make a complex. Because it's big, isn't it? If you have, let me say, five or six IgMs binding around antigens, you're gonna have a big mass, isn't it? That's gonna be formed, okay? Compared to, say, five IgG binding around antigens, isn't it? Which one is going to elicit a higher reaction is the IgM, because it's bigger, okay? So this is why these ones are more efficient, because they make bigger immune complexes, isn't it? Okay? And then those immune complexes can actually activate their immune response, okay? So this is why this one is actually more efficient. And agglutination, complement fixation, uh, as well as antibody-antigen reactions, okay? So the same thing, bacteria and virus, isn't it? Okay? This one can be produced by a fetus undergoing infection. Okay. So remember, the IgG acts as a word for the fetus, guys. It's passive, isn't it? It gives the fetus passive immunity. Okay? Because the fetus has not produced the, the antibody, isn't it? It's from the mother. So it's just floating within the fetus blood, trying to help the fetus fight infection. But then if the fetus actually gets infected by something, and then the B cells from the fetus actually function, isn't it? What are they going to produce? Ig, IgM, isn't it? Okay, very good. So if you, uh, uh, if, if maybe a baby is born, okay, and then you draw the blood, okay, and then you find high levels of IgM, then you know the fetus has been born with an infection, okay? This is how you can actually taste for some of these things. For instance, if you uh, uh, maybe had um, an STD, okay, when you are pregnant, such as gonorrhea, isn't it? There's not, there's not STDs that can pass to the, to the baby, isn't it? Okay, so you can check the baby's blood when they are born to check if they also got infected or not while you were pregnant. And that is going to be shown by the amount of IgM that they have in their, in their blood. Are we clear, guys? Okay, very good. 
Okay? It can't cross the placenta for obvious reasons, isn't it? It's big, isn't that so? Yeah, so it can't cross. Okay? Then we have IG, IGA. Okay, IGA, this one, about 10 to 15 percent, okay, found in the serum. It is mostly found in secretions, isn't it? Okay, so any organ that is secreting something is going to have high levels of IgA. So which secretions do we find the IgA in, guys? So gastric fluid, isn't it? That's for sure one of them. Okay, what else? Where else? Hmm? Saliva, yes, where else? Huh? Tears, isn't it? Mucus in all the areas where mucus is produced, right? Okay, so all mucus membranes are going to have high levels of? of uh, IgA, isn't it? Okay. So it's going to be found in the saliva, in the tears, in the milk. You guys have heard of colostrum, isn't it? What is colostrum? Who knows what colostrum is? First mucus, isn't it? After she has a baby. That mucus has got very high levels of IgA. That is why it's very good for the baby. It is protective of the baby. Because remember, one, when a baby is born, it's the first time that they're eating food for the first time, isn't it? Okay? And sometimes, we don't regulate the uh, temperature of the milk properly. You know that? With all this testing and so on, even if we test, you use, we use the, what, the wrist and the elbow and what test whether the milk is hot or not. Sometimes we use thermometers, isn't it? But every baby has got different threshold for what is hot to them, which you don't know, isn't it? So sometimes they actually get tears from feeding, okay? And then also as the baby is feeding, remember their, uh, their intestines are also unraveling, isn't it? Lengthening and then trying to like, to accommodate the food. That also causes them to have tears, okay? So that is why the colostrum is very important because it's going to line the entire GIT. So that in case I'm preparing that milk, okay? You didn't do a good job if you're giving the baby formula for instance then uh, they can protect the, the, themselves from the bacteria in their milk if you're going to breastfeed that's different isn't it because remember the temperature of the breast milk is going to be uh, 37 degrees isn't it close isn't it because body temperature baby was not going to have a reaction to that okay yes Yeah, IgM or IgA? IgM, that's the... Mukaliko IgM, boss. Okay, cool. It's big, yes. How do you find it? From the baby's own cells. Remember I said the baby's... Baby's got cells, remember? Yes, so baby's got cells. <laughs> but remember that most of the time we expect that the baby is going to find infection for the first time after they are born. We don't expect the baby to have infection in utero, isn't it? But in case you give a baby infection because you have an infection yourself, then they can get an infection, isn't it? And that will activate their adaptive immune response, you get. Okay, Ah, uh, yes, please. Which pH? To what? No, I was saying that in preparation of milk, for instance, isn't it? Say you are, okay, say you're doing, some people do mixed feeding, isn't it? Okay, what to breastfeed the baby as well as give them formula, okay? So in terms of formula production, you have to warm the milk, isn't it? And give it a certain temperature, okay? So you don't know you as an individual. You may just be told that, no, you've tried this. If the, if the milk feels cool on your wrist, you can give it to the baby and so on. Those are things that I, I talked about. But no one knows the baby's ability, okay, or their temperature uh, sensitivity, isn't it? Okay? So what you may consider cool enough for the baby may still be hot for the, for the baby. That's what I'm saying. So it's not, it's not about the baby... Uh, Controlling the temperature, about the milk, I mean the AJ that's found in the breast milk of the mother. Okay. Yes, please. Oh, 
Yes. <laughs> no, I was saying that when you have a baby, after baby is born, okay, the first milk that is going to be released from your breast is colostrum. Okay? It's not very rich in fat, it's rich in uh, carbohydrates, but also got a lot of IgA. Okay, yes. Can't best treat. So the baby loses out. Okay, baby loses out because remember, breast milk, that's the that's the passive, uh, it's passive immunity. Okay? This is why poor are actually advising for poor to do what? To um to give babies breast milk. <laughs> no, unless maybe the formula that you give the baby uh, has got uh, antibodies. I don't know. Okay, which is most. And then the problem is that the antibodies that we found from cow milk cannot function in our body. You get my point. So it's difficult. That is why even for HIV positive mothers, we still advise them to breastfeed, isn't it? for at least six months, okay? So that they can actually help, because if a mother is HIV positive, okay, and they're born with an HIV positive, uh, I mean, if the baby is born, even though the baby does not uh, react positive immediately, we still give the baby medication, isn't it? For some time, okay? So we still allow it to breastfeed, breastfeed the baby, so that they can also get the immune immunity that you have from the milk. Okay, after six months, it becomes difficult, isn't it? Because maybe it's, uh, it's HIV negative, maybe after that they'll stop taking the medication. So it becomes risky, isn't it? For you to continue breastfeeding the child. Okay, are we clear? Uh, yes, please. In the what? <laughs> the colon, in the GIT. Ah. Mm -hmm. Colon selection. <laughs> Clonal selection. Yes. <laughs> hey guys, it's just emphasizing the clonoid. Yes. No. I can't get it because it has a laughing. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. No, the body can't make antibodies for variants that doesn't exist because remember, the, the antibodies are being made from the antibodies that has already been recognized, isn't it? So it's not possible, it's not, the body is not a miracle worker. So whatever you expose it to, it will try to fight that, okay? But if it's not been exposed to it, it can't make antibodies for things that have not been exposed to it before, okay? Yes, can you move on? Yeah, boss, come back on then. Yes. <laughs> yes. So it means we missed the last lecture, I think it was. Because I think I really explained that in the last lecture. That in so many different immunity, for instance, the T cells, CD4 cells, once they're activated, there are two types, T helper 1 and T helper 2. T helper 1 is going to use macrophages to fight the infection. Okay? T helper 2 is going to use what? Anti bodies, isn't it? Okay, so they're able to stimulate other cells. Okay. And once those cells are stimulated, yes, then they can also call other cells to come to the site of infection. Okay? Thank you. I think let's move on, guys. We're almost done. So IgA, we've talked about the thing, isn't it? Okay. Um, it's found in the secretions. It's divalent also. Okay, so IgM is divalent when it's in the blood. You get my point? In the blood is divalent, but when it goes into secretions, it changes. It becomes uh, tetravalent because it forms polymers. It interrupts the other IgMs in the form clusters. That's what you've seen on top there, isn't it? Have you seen the different uh, IgMs? Some where, where there are two 
It can be one, there can be two, there can be three. Okay? So in the blood, it is uh, it's, uh, monovalent, isn't it? Okay? I mean, bivalent. Okay? Yeah, bivalent. But when it goes to in the secretions, it's uh, connected to the other IGS. So that's what makes it big. Okay? Because remember, uh, okay, yeah, that's, that's one. Okay, this one can cross the placenta, the IgA, isn't it? Because the placenta interaction between the mother and the baby is through the what? Blood, isn't it? Yeah, so it can cross the placenta, okay, and assist. So it also helps with the passive immunity of the baby, okay? IgA, okay, this one, we talk about IgA for two important things, isn't it? Number one is what, guys? Allergic? Reactions, isn't it? Okay. So in allergies, if you have, a, you guys, excuse me. If you want to leave, please just quietly walk out. I won't stop you from leaving. You get my point? Then in Muntali, in the congregation, I just stand up, get your bag slowly, move out. Your friends want to learn, you continue doing what? Learning. Well, the finding difficulties, finding time to learn. Okay, you guys have found a space that come, isn't it? Okay, so if you want to learn, learn. If you want to learn, please feel free. By all means, you can walk out. Okay, who we'll meet hey, in the test, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so those want to learn, let them learn. Those who don't want, please, you're free to go. In fact, don't even come in the, in the first place. Hey? They're not willing to learn. Because I think it's really disrespectful and bad manners to whine. Yeah, whining, and the guy, for that matter, whining. It's an attractive line, guys. Please. <laughs> so, I was talking about the IgA, okay? IgA is very important for allergic reactions as well as uh, parasitic infections, okay? Because, one, we talked about the fact that if you have um, an infection, primary IgA is isolated, most of the bacteria and viruses, you're going to have IgG, isn't it, in the memory cells. But if it's a parasitic antigen, okay, that has caused that primary response, what is going to be there in the uh, memory cells? Ig, Ig, isn't it? Okay. And also, say you've got a worm infestation, okay, whether it's foot worm, whatever worm that it is, whatever parasite that it is, isn't it? Your body is going to also make high levels of IgE. This is why now, if you get the full blood count of someone, okay, and you check the white blood cells that are there, if it's only neutrophils that are very high, okay, most likely it's a bacterial infection, isn't it? Okay. If say you see the high uh, um, number of lymphocytes as well as neutrophils, what is going to come to your mind? Viral, isn't it? it? Could be viral or could be a tumor, isn't it? Okay. So say you have high levels of obesinal fuels in the blood, or basal fuels, what comes into your mind? Hypersensitivity reactions, isn't it? Or even allergic reactions, or parasitic. So this is how you're actually able to know, okay? What is affected, this is how you diagnose disease, guys. You check the blood of patients, then you will see which cells are affected. It gives you an idea of what it's supposed to do, isn't it? Okay, so it's very important for you to know. So IgA, it's not failure, it's not one of the things, isn't it? Because it's not failure, the one that carries the IgG, isn't it? Okay? And then also, uh, in hermetic infections, of just simply parasitic infections, you're going to have high levels of Ig, IgE in the, in the blood. Okay? And then, apart from it being found in the blood and so on, it can be found also in secretions, okay, the IgE. Because remember, most of these cells, they're going to be found in the tissue, isn't it? Okay, so they can actually feed into their secretions. Okay. IgD. Okay, so IgD, we said it's found on, on um, which kind of cells? All of them are found in B cells, guys. Which kind of, which kind of B cells? The naive, isn't it? Yes. Naive B cells are only going to have IgM and IgD, isn't it? Okay, so in terms of the IgD in serum, they don't know its function in the serum, okay? They only know its function within the naive B cell. 
it helps with uh, immune response, okay, with the, because remember these are forms part of the receptor of the beta receptor, okay, so it helps in the interaction between the uh, B cell and the antigen for the first time. That is what is known. But in terms of its functionality, like how we can talk about the IgE B one is efficient, and also being high in maybe like some some of these diarrheal diseases, like uh, viral ones I talked about last time, isn't it? It's not going to be the, the same. The okay. IgD is mostly seen in naive uh, B cells and helps with the listing of the immune response, isn't it? Okay, but it's got no known function, okay, in the serum. So if you find the function of IgD in the serum, you can write a paper about it, isn't it? we can make you professor or something, okay? So this is basically just a table. You can go through it on your own time. It kind of give you differentiation between the different types, isn't it? The properties and so on, okay? Yes, please. Yes, madam. You said the IgA1, IgD, they are found on the naive cells. Yes. Yes. Does that mean that when they mature, or maybe all the cells after they mature, they have got IgD? No, naive does not mean the cell is mature. Is that what I said, guys? No. The cell that has not just been uh, bound to an antigen. You get? So as long as a cell has never interacted with an antigen before, it was that naive. B cell, naive B cell. Yes. Mm. As, uh, N -N 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 naive B cell is a cell that has not interacted with, with an antigen. With an antigen, yes. So now, before the IG, let me give an example of IG, IgG. Yes. So the. Uh... <laughs> 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 I know my yes. <laughs> okay, you answered yourself, right? You might answer yourself, right? Hey? That's cool. Okay, that means you're reasoning, isn't it? That's good. Okay. So now let's put the antibody functions, guys, quickly. There are about five main functions of antibodies, okay? Number one, it is neutralizing or blocking, okay? So for instance, we've got a bacteria, and then it is surrounded, okay, by antibodies. That bacteria won't have the ability to bind to any cell in the body, isn't it? So antibodies are called the function of neutralizing pathogen before they even bind in our bodies. That's why they're found in the secretion, they're found in the blood and so on and so forth. That's, all, that's one of the main functions is its ability to actually bind to the antigens, prevent them from uh, access uh, to the cells. Sometimes some of these bacteria can produce toxins, isn't it? And the toxins only function once they access the cell, isn't it? So if the antibodies surround the toxin, then the toxin won't have access to their cells. So that's the first function. It is neutralizing or blocking. Okay. Then complement fixation is another function. We talked about it earlier. Okay. So IgG and IgM are the ones that are known as complement fixators. Okay. They're going to uh, activate the membrane attack complex. Okay. That's a complex that is created once the complement reaches its full maturity. And this function it is to lyse the cells, isn't it? So once the antibodies bind an antigen and activate the complement, then the complement can now be activated from the MAC and co-cytolysis of the cells, okay? So that's another function, it is complement activation, okay? Antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, okay? So this is where the T-helper cells come in, okay? T helper cells can be activated and you intend to activate the B cells, isn't it? Produce more antibodies, and that's all. Okay? So if the antibodies are fighting uh, an antigen because they've been activated by the T cells, then that function falls under um, antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. You get. If the antibodies are just fighting the antigen on their own without any activation, then that is antibody independent. You get? Okay. So if the T helper cells are in charge of activating the antibodies to fight infection, then you have the, the Okay. 
So this one uh, very important, especially when you're dealing with one uh, very uh, uh, very lean pathogens, okay? Or if pathogen is very big, isn't it? So you want more. For instance, the amount of antibodies you will need to surround a bacteria and the amount of antibodies you will need to surround a worm is the same amount. It's different amounts, isn't it? For the other, we need more antibodies, okay? So for very big pathogens, they'll need the help of the T-helper cells, isn't it? To activate them more, okay? So they can do a better job at fighting that infection, okay? If the pathogen, especially if the antigen is uh, a polysaccharide or a lipid, which are not very immunogenic, then it may fight those on its own, okay? So most of the times for ADCC, it's gonna be protein antigens or very large antigens. This is when the uh, lymphocytes come in, okay, to help the antibodies in fighting the infection. Okay, agglutination, okay? This is what I talked about where you have antigen, antibody complexing, isn't it? Okay, when an antibody binds to an antigen, that is known as an antigen antibody complex, complex. Okay, this is what I'm talking about the fact that an IgM binding to antibody versus IgG binding to antibody, there's going to be difference in the immune response, at least there isn't it? Okay, because IgM is going to make a bigger immune complex compared to IgG. So it's going to activate the immune system more, isn't it? Okay, so sometimes the antibodies are going to bind to antigens. And once they bind antigens, that will activate the macrophages to come and clear those complexes, okay? As the macrophages are clearing the complexes, they're getting rid of their pathogen, isn't it? Okay, so that is agglutination, guys. A good, another a good example of agglutination is when you uh, get blood that is not compatible to you, okay? The antibodies are going to aggregate those red blood cells that don't have the same blood type as yourself and form a complex, okay? It's what informs the immune system that the blood that you receive this is wrong, okay? And that immune response is going to cause you to have a high temperature and then we stop giving you that blood, isn't it? Okay, and then we find blood that's actually compatible with yours, okay? So this is very important for, apart from it's helping clear, I mean, clearance of ant uh, antigens, it's also helpful to inform the body that there's something that has entered into the system, isn't it? Okay. Oxonization. I think we talked about it already, isn't it? In the previous lectures. This is where antibodies caught antigens to increase the appetite of the phagocytes to actually phagocytose, isn't it? Okay, the antigens. Okay. So this one is something we've been talking about, guys. We've been putting them on your own, isn't it? Okay. The last two slides. Okay, so number one is what are the similarities between the B cell receptor and the T cell receptor? Okay, we know the T cell receptor is made up of CD3, isn't it? Okay, and the B cell receptor is made up of what? The antibodies, isn't it? Okay, so if it's in, if it's in a naive uh, B cell, we're talking about IgM, isn't it? Okay, and then if it's in the memory B cell, it could be IgA, IgG, or IgE, isn't it? Okay, so now what is the difference between the receptors found on the B cells and the receptors found on the T cells? Okay, so the similarity is both of them are going to be able to bind and visit it. Okay, but then the difference is that the B cell receptor cannot bind antigens directly. Isn't that so? B I mean, T cell receptor, isn't it? It can only bind antigens when they present it via the MHC. Okay. And then both of them are heterodimers, isn't it? Okay, they both have both co uh, constant and variable regions. So constant regions determine what type of receptor it is. The variable regions look at antigen uh, variability, isn't it? Okay. Then the differences, okay? Antibodies can be both soluble and membrane bound, okay? Most of we can find antibodies in the blood, in the lymph, in the GIT, and so on, isn't it? Okay? T cell receptors are stuck on the T cells. So they can only interact with antigen while they're still on the cell. Antibodies can react with the antigen both in the blood as well as on the, on the B cell, isn't it? Okay? 
And then while a tissue receptor has got only one binding site for the antigen, antibodies have got how many? Minimum of two, isn't it? Maximum of 10, okay? So that's the difference, that's the other difference that is there, okay? And then of course, the tissue receptor is short and wider, okay, than the fat region of the uh, antibody, okay? And then of course, this one is it's almost the same point in the first one. The beta receptors can recognize soluble and circulating, and because they're found everywhere, isn't it? Okay. I think I talked about this already. The T cells can only interact with antigen based on the MHC class, isn't it? While well, beta can interact with the antigen directly. Okay. And then, because beta receptors have got two mechanisms, isn't it? Of variability, which are the somatic hypermutation and the clone selection. That put a higher affinity to antigens compared to the T cell receptors. Okay, we've come to the end of the lecture, guys. Unless there are questions. No questions? You can ask them here. Don't want to go, please go. No, I'm telling you. Ask.